everyone doing today? Excellent. Good, good. Um, we're going to start. We've got a little technical difficulties. Figure that out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Microsoft guys get the technical difficulties. So we're going to get some sound plugged in here, hopefully in the midstream, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Matthew Duncan. I lead the thought leadership around the future of work at Microsoft, which means I wake up every morning thinking about, okay, where is work going? And you can, and I know you can imagine this because we all lived through it over the last three years. It's been a crazy wild ride no one could have ever imagined. Um, and I'm here to tell you that the ride is gonna get even more exciting. So um, future really means what's happening at the tip of our nose in a lot of cases of just what's next. And so we're gonna dive into that a little bit today. Hi, and I'm Craig Watkins, uh, professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and also one of the um, co uh, in principal investigators for a system wide uh, grand challenge at UT Austin called Good Systems, which is essentially a reference to what is commonly uh, referred to as ethical and responsible artificial intelligence. So we're thinking a lot about this interaction between human intelligence and machine intelligence, and what are some of the social behavioral uh, impacts related to that. So happy to be here with you today. Yeah, so our you to walk away with at least three new ideas. Um, we'd like to make it an interactive conversation, so we're gonna pause often, throw some conversation or questions out to you all. We'd love to hear you chime in and, and get some perspective. It was like last night's dinner. The beauty is in the engagement and sort of that conversation that happens. So we're gonna go back and forth sharing a little bit of um, some thoughts, and uh, I'm gonna start off with some research, right? So, um, grab this off of Instagram this week. Swipe your badge or get fired. Employees and workers face a reckoning. We saw a little of that reenacted last night, the pressure and the tension based on that. So, first question up. What type of work policy does your organization have? And now I'm on? Oh, wow. Did you need that? I don't think I did. You, can you still hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Let's not go there. <laughs> Okay, so a little quiz. Um, in office, number one, hybrid, that's you know half and half, or somewhere around that, or fully remote. Give me a show of hands. Who is in office? Full time in office. Yeah, okay, I like it. Your commute must be super short. <laughs> so the, pain, the pain threshold wasn't there. Hybrid, who's doing hybrid? On to record. Okay, got it. I'll try to do my thing. So the majority hybrid? Okay, who is fully remote? Oh, that's awesome. That's really great. Um, and w for those who were fully remote, were you fully remote prior to the pandemic? How many, show of hands, who was prior to? Okay, so a little about a mix. Um, Lots of, lots of interesting voyage relative to research and data when it comes to work. I love to start there because I think that's a really important area and trend to look at sort of where, where we were with work and flexible work. And um, at Microsoft, we have um, a myriad of different research resources that we leverage. We have 500 uh, individuals on staff doing research. We're working with LinkedIn um, and their economic graph, pulling that data in. We have the privilege of, of sort of looking at telemetry. So if you can imagine trillions of signals of everyone using Microsoft 365 across the, the planet, um, of course, aggregated, um, but very useful to understand the patterns of what's happening in work. And then um, my team runs the Work Trend Index. What that is is a survey that goes out to 31 countries, uh, 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 31,000 individuals, and we're just wrapping up uh, the next annual coming out here in May. But there's some some really interesting insights that you know that really come to bear when we think about where we are with work in general and this voyage or as um, we were talking about last night, the great experiment. Over three years, we didn't plan for it, but what have we actually learned? What are we gonna accept and, and so hopefully adopt that were benefits? And what are we gonna like, need to really continue to adjust? And so we came, we came down to like three core things, right? Um, the normalization of flexibility. Really flexible, as you saw in many of the hands here, 
is, is truly becoming part of the process and, um, and really coming to life. And a couple really interesting research uh, working with the team over at Stanford, Nick Bloom, the economist there, has been studying work from home for several decades and specifically had done specific research recently. And where the, where the, where the like, tide line is right now is about 28% of people, um, and that is both frontline and information workers um, are working from home. So it's a mix, call it about two and a half days. It fluctuates a little bit, but we're starting to see a steady trend based off of that. What's happening in the market? Fr frankly, even though we've seen some, Microsoft includes some uh, attrition of recent with layoffs, et cetera, the fact of the matter is the, mar the market is still very hot when it comes to the labor standpoint. And interestingly enough, LinkedIn just did some research, and 14% of their job postings are still focused on remote jobs, and yet 52% of all the applicants were going after that 14% of job postings. So the desire from the employee base is, I want to have that flexibility uh, in my work situation. Number two was what we called and coined this concept around productivity paranoia. <laughs> So in our latest research, um, we went out and asked the simple question, do you as an employee feel productive in your day? Do you feel like you're really making you know, uh, your goals and, and a difference? And 87% of the people said, I feel like I'm productive at work, whether that meant in the office, remote, et cetera. We asked the same leaders in that same survey, um, do you feel your team is productive? And what we heard is 12%. And that was it. And so what's behind that? I mean, does that seem um, likely in your organization? Are you feeling that disconnect between leaders, feeling that pressure? Show of hands, anyone's feeling it? OK. Yeah, yeah. In, in having that conversation with many leaders, what we hear is, um, yeah, there's a sense of, I don't see my employees, so therefore I'm not sure they're being productive. And this fear, perhaps we could call it a lack of trust. Um, we work with one of the economists um, uh, from ADP, uh, Neela Richardson, and she talked about this psychology behind an individual who thinks about productivity. I'm a worker. I think about my world, my productivity, and leaders who think about organizational, cross-organizational productivity, like how is it working across the organization. and. Um, yeah, what we found out in the pandemic, we lost a lot of those ties that were cross-organizational. In fact, it was, I think, 37% of those cross-organizational ties got weaker during those pandemic years. So it really causes us to think, OK, how are we measuring and how are we thinking about um, productivity uh, and the disconnect between, I feel, as you saw on stage last night, I feel like I'm a worker and I want this, and the employer saying, you need to come back to the office. So this is the next question I get. How do I get people back into my office? It's like the question I get most often um, in the last couple months from CEOs visiting um, at Microsoft. And we went out and asked. And so what did we find? It was I would go back to the office more frequently for my friends and my coworkers. It was humans, right? I'm gonna come back in for humans. Not the fear of my leadership or my manager not seeing me, that proximity bias, which I think was telling, right? It really spoke to the fact that we as humans need to come back in person, but we need to be intentional about when we come back, right? Productivity and office don't necessarily have to be the same or at odds, but you just have to be intentional about why and when. Yes. I'm curious. I think this. I, I think this is very true, especially given what I see in my organization. Yes. But I also had a lot of people join during the pandemic, yes. where they likely don't have those work friends because they've only been interacting over Zoom. And so I wonder if you have any insights around that group of people. A absolutely. So two thoughts there. One is early in career. Yeah, they were more, uh, they had a higher desire to come back into that office. 
And um, that I get this uh, interesting comment from many CEOs that will say like, I thought that was the digitally you know, informed uh, you know, era, right? What are those, why do they need to come back in? Well, because it's the same reason that we all enjoyed. Personal connection, learning through osmosis, getting encultured, you know, part of that culture was part of the process. And the problem is, is those that have been around that already have a network are pretty comfortable just sitting back at home or in their remote place and not coming back. And so there has to be intention because if we don't connect those dots, it's going to get it's going to get lost. And um, I think the point that we keep coming back to is in design and how you think about your work week. One size doesn't fit all, but at that team level, really being intentional about when do we come together for what type of work and just having to be more instructive about when that happens, when does it not happen. And uh, we're learning, right? At Microsoft, we're still learning and, and how that rhythm is. My um, CVP of our entire division, you know, we live, we're living this, right? I've had this debate at dinner last night, like, is there pressure to change on the flexible work? And we're not. But with that said, we're bringing everyone in from all over, because we hired from everywhere now, into headquarters or a location to have time together at least for three days, you know, every other quarter. So only just twice a year. But that unto itself refuels energy. And that energy can be leveraged when you go back into that remote side of things. Okay, coordination tax. So this is another term. Well, one of the other things that we found out that happened during the pandemic is, wow, who feels a little overloaded by too many emails, too many chats, too many connections, too much, too much technology, <laughs> says the technology guy. That, it is a lot. It is a lot. And I think um, we're seeing massive patterns and spikes on just the volume of emails, the volumes of chat. Um, we're seeing interesting patterns in meeting times shrinking. So um, five, excuse me, 15 minute meetings are up 9% year over year. Hour long meetings are down 11% year over year. We're trying to adapt and figure out sort of that sort of connection of when we meet and how we meet. But let me, be tr let me tell you one truth here. It is complex. Right, because we used to be in a society and work where it was like synchronized. We'd go to the office, we'd get work done, async. I'm, you know, remote or traveling or doing my thing. Now we live in a world of async and sync all the time. In person, we're syncing and asyncing. You know, remote, we're asyncing. And that's just a lot of complexity. And so the challenge is is to figure out what those work patterns that work best for your team for individuals and try to make those part of your sort of agenda and routine. So what does that bring this to? Well, a really interesting point in that we're here, we know flexible work has some really positive value to the organization, to individuals. We know complexity came with it. So what's gonna change? How do we unlock this? And so I'm gonna pass this over to Craig here to talk a little bit about sort of what we're doing when it comes to AI. Yeah, absolutely, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, so uh, initial question, just out of curiosity, uh, who has tried, experimented with, or played with uh, ChatGPT? Okay, a number of you. Uh, any initial thoughts or reactions? You like it? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Okay, All right, great. Um, any, any favorite prompts anyone would like to share uh, which you've uh, asked or inquired the system to do or generate for you? Okay, what's the craziest prompt? Any, what have you done? They don't want to share. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to mention it. <laughs> Did my LinkedIn blog post, no. Uh, yeah, people are doing that. I've seen recipes, I've seen travel, I've seen Christmas cards, uh, yeah. It's, it's definitely interesting. I didn't have a crazy, my wife said we couldn't do a date night in cell and she finished writing a letter of recommendation for her friend. Okay. I said, okay, well tell me about your friend. <laughs> <laughs> recommendation for this friend with these attributes and qualities, you know, and a little bit of this later. And 15 minutes we were, she wrapped up, okay. she did a little bit of <laughs> sort of a, a review to make sure that it actually sounded in her voice. But, um, awesome. 
created this date night for us. Hey. <laughs> I like it. That sounds like a very useful, productive way. So there are, of course, um, uh, a lot of conversation going on right now about generative AI. And uh, we wanted to just create a little bit of time and space here today uh, just to sort of think out loud about the implications for generative AI in the workplace. And for many of you uh, in your work organizations, uh, managing talent, recruiting talent, uh, overseeing processes, just beginning to sort of think about, right, as you lean into the future, uh, what these systems might mean for you and your organizations in terms of the kind of work that you're creating, in terms of the kinds of expertise that are, I think, increasingly required to um, work with these systems in a way that's both efficient, uh, proficient, uh, but also um, ethical and, and responsible as well. And as I said um, in my introduction, we spent a lot of time at the University of Texas at Austin with the Good Systems Grand Challenge thinking about um, what does it mean to design good systems, that is to say systems that are ethical, systems that are responsible, systems that are in some ways, right, uh, not producing or reproducing the kinds of social inequities and uh, sort of disparities that are, you know, kind of uh, part of our um, sort of modern world, if you will. Um, so you, OpenAI uh, and DALI2, uh, uh, not quite sure how many of you have, have, are familiar with this. ChatGPT has been getting uh, a lot of attention. But here is, a, a, for example, a prompt, a photo of a border uh, collie uh, by the Space Needle. And what might it generate for you? These are all computer generated. Further, uh, by the Space Needle wearing a hat. And just based on this text prompt, <laughs> it, can, it can generate this for you as well. Uh, wearing a hat at sunset. And it can generate that for you as well. And this is all right, based on the set of language models, uh, the kind of neural networks that these systems oftentimes are sort of um, being driven by. But it's able to just create content that, let's say, for example, you were, your organization was, you were creating a deck, a uh, presentation of some sort, and you needed images, right, that were quite unique, uh, images, right, that were novel, that you couldn't find from a traditional or typical Google search. This now might allow you to generate, right, custom-made uh, content, custom-made images that are in some ways sort of resonant with the goals of your presentation or mission or charge that your organization is pursuing. Of course, uh, this is just uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what um, you know, these technologies can create. Uh, in addition to images, um, these large language models are now able to write code. Uh, they're able to, of course, uh, with ChatGPT, uh, generate uh, human-like uh, essays, human-like responses, um, human-like information. Uh, that's quite amazing. And the fact that, they, that these systems can do this to your point, in enough time to get you and your wife out on uh, the, the dinner date yeah. uh, sort of speaks to uh, the, uh, the sort of um, the, the kind of impact that these systems are just beginning to have. Yeah, so this goes through an example of ChatGPT. If you've played with it, it's using that natural language. Uh, it's also translating it, you know, for you, which is really incredibly powerful in this case changing it into a tweet, so understanding the characters needed and required to make that happen. Then, you know, go and um, tell, tell them that I would like to go um, to San Francisco, or excuse me, to Seattle. Give me an itinerary. These are the things I care about, I'm interested in. Plots it all out. Um, you know, and for the most part, I've, I've tried this and, and actual travel planning. Uh, it got me lost a couple times, but for the, for the most part, it actually is very accurate, insightful, and uh, really quite um, eloquent in sort of how it constructs and drives um, to the answer that you're looking for. And one of the things we'll do here in a moment is ask you to think about what are some ways in which you might think about adopting and applying these kinds of systems in your organization. Are there specific things, for example, that you have in mind or could think of where uh, these kinds of intelligent solutions might be an asset for you uh, and the goals of your organization, respectively? This is a really interesting slide, right, based on some research that's been conducted, but just sort of, um, sort of projecting just the amount of content that would be generated by these systems in a very short time, right? So the, 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 the rate of adoption, that adoption curve, right, is accelerating quicker and quicker. We know that since ChatGPT was, was, was uh, released publicly uh, back in November, I forget now where we are in terms of just the, the millions of people around the world, hundreds right. of millions of people around yeah. the world who are playing with this system and suggesting, right, that it, um, it's generating not only a lot of attention, but a lot of engagement. Uh, and of course, right, what we're curious about here is how this engagement, how this adoption uh, might play out in the context of your respective organizations. 
The, the, other, the only other thing that I would add here, right, is that there are certainly, right, a lot of caveats to sort of think about. In other words, these systems clearly aren't perfect. And so if you are, if you're thinking about incorporating these systems into your organizations, into your workflow, sort of thinking about, right, what are some of the, the, the challenges uh, now? So they're known and unknown challenges, right? I think that's one of the really interesting things about these systems. There's some things, right, that we're able to identify currently, but as we began to sort of adopt these systems more regularly, more routinely, there will certainly be additional challenges, right, that we likely can't even think of now. So some obvious challenges, right, are, if you're having AI sort of generate content for you, let's say it's a report that your organization wants to release. You wanna make sure, right, that that report is fact-checked. Uh, make sure, right, that the content, right, is consistent with your mission, your values, your ethics as an organization. We would encourage, right, to always have sort of humans in the loop. In other words, um, I would advise against, you know, generating an AI piece of, of content and then releasing it without any kind of human supervision or uh, kind of uh, monitoring. And so that's certainly something to think about, right, is how do you sort of integrate humans into the loop so that there's always that capacity, right, to be responsible uh, and aware of what you're generating. There obviously right, are copyright issues, right, that are certainly important to think about, particularly if you're releasing documents publicly. Uh, in addition to, uh, we're understanding, right, that these systems can, uh, quote unquote, hallucinate at times, sort of yeah. generate, sort of fabricate content. And so again, you wanna make sure that fact checking is taking place. And we know, right, because these systems are pulling from these neural networks and pulling from various kinds of data sets and data sources, that there may be sort of issues related to bias, issues related to generating content that you as an organization may not stand behind. And so there are all of these kinds of, uh, I think, challenges that we're just beginning to understand. And those are the known challenges, right? I think there are unknown challenges, too, as this rate of adoption continues to accelerate. Yeah, and with any technology, um, we're going to learn. We're going to learn a lot. And... Uh, yeah, I think the way we love to coin it is it's almost like more of a co-pilot than an autopilot. So it is definitely not there to take over, you know, your work, et cetera. Um, it is there to be an added value. And, you know, I think um, uh, if you really put it in context of it's there to actually get you from good to great. So we like to say, like, if there's something you're doing and you're good at it, it's probably going to make you better, right? Whether that's giving you more time, that's giving you more uh, pointed research, bringing all that and synthesizing it into one place. So you can use the brain power that you have to really take it and elevate it to that next level. So the, the, the fascinating question is, okay, you've played with it. You've, you know, written, written a reference letter um, in your work life. You, you know, stop for a second and think about, like, what is the one thing you wish it could help? If it had a magic wand, I'm curious as to if you've pondered where you think AI could have a real valuable impact in just your daily work life. Anyone? Yeah. We've dealt with it just a little bit with performance reviews. You know, can we give managers the first 60% of beautiful content based on a couple of other inputs? And so it's just, you know, we're in the experimentation zone. Any any thoughts? I mean, does it work, or do you yeah, find it that it's okay? I mean, it works in that it gives you sixty percent. You know, the, instead of spending two hours, okay, let me pull everything together and get a starting point. Right. Like, here's the thirty second starting point. <coughs> now, where do you go from there? And so, I think if you use it just on its face, on, on what its returns initially, you'd be disappointed in your employee would go, "When this wasn't thoughtful, and did the machine write this?" Right. But at least it gives you a starting point and some, you know, some basic vocabulary for it. But we also did a white paper with the tech team on the use of chat GPT and our corporate guardrails guard around it. And we used chat GPT as the foundation starting point. That there yeah. won't be a paper on this. We spent the entire week on the, our tech team. We refined it. And you know, again, it's like a 60 credit set starting point. You're not yeah. starting with a blank sheet. A paper, but you know, it gave us enough that we could socialize and venture back and forth to get something that actually was really good. I love it. And, and I really like that example. And so as you can imagine, right, this issue is hitting really hard, right, in the world of education. So for example, um, you know, in the university context, right, as, as soon as this technology began to start becoming more widely adopted back in November, December, January, a lot of panic among universities, you probably saw in the New York Times, some universities, right, uh, disrupting access to ChatGPT, uh, a number of secondary schools doing, doing similar. 
Um, but I, I really like the, and, and part of the pushback against that, right, is that we should not be denying access to these tools, but really helping students, helping young people develop the capacity to leverage and use these tools for higher impact. Uh, and I think that's really, I think, the challenge for all of us. What I like about this example, right, is that what, what you and your organization did was you used ChatGPT not as, a, as an end for an outcome, but as a way just to get the conversation started, the process yeah. started. And so I think that's really interesting and an example of what we, this sort of human in the loop process, right, where you're not exclusively relying on the system, but rather, you, to your point, are you kind of co-piloting the system, therefore making sure that you're getting to the end point, getting to those goals and outcomes that are unique or specific to your organization. Question or thought? Yeah, um, I think that's a great example of performance reviews, but I will say at least my personal reaction was like, oh no. <laughs> because I could see people taking it and being like, I'm not good, good, good enough, or I'd like slight tweaks, and um, I don't know, like, like I, just, I, know, I just wanted to share you know, my reaction. I, I totally agree with you, and that's not how the performance reviews, and my team sort of goes, yeah, let's look at how people done. We still see, you know, 15% didn't put any textual content in there. You know, of those we need to dive deeper on those that do, it's like, you got a couple bullet points. Was that helpful to you or not? And so, again, it's, it doesn't solve the manager laziness thing. Yeah. That's how we're going to be. But yeah. it could give them another tool to go, yeah, hey, look, put your free bullet points in here. Yeah. With some tonal sort of over some overtone guidance, and see if you get something a little bit better than not giving your employees anything. Yeah, no, it's, it's so true. It and is. Yeah. I like, so I liked the example, yeah. and I also really disliked yeah. it. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Right. Yeah. But like, the example that I had in my head that I that I thought was really helpful was like, hey, this is job descriptions, right? Like, job just using that as a starting point for job description. Sure. Job description, because anyways, we are searching the internet or searching previous yeah. job descriptions, and right. honestly, if they don't tweak it that much, I'm actually okay with that, right? Um, but it is, but I think that people would really appreciate using it for reviews, it's just as a matter of using it currently. What inputs, yeah, did yeah. You, what inputs did you use? Did you give it somehow access to some kind of like... We didn't, we didn't do anything fancy of that. We put in some verbatim sort of feedback and some like bullet point themes and here's my mid-year write-up. Yeah. What can you do with this? Yeah. yeah so, I mean, so the human was kind of collecting some of the... Yeah, but I mean, fast forward next week, the human's not going to do that. Next week, it's going to be... I'm going to feed that from, yeah. and we'll layer that on top of our work basis or whatever yeah. that goes. Yeah. yeah, it's already here. Here's your starting point that consolidates your, you know, your recognition awards with your feedback awards with, you know, your sort of day-to-day -day notes as a manager. Yeah. Here's your starting point, manager. It's lousy, but your job is to give the right feedback. So, yeah. you know, that's funny. Our choice was really, I mean, ours was more dabbling, and that's what the zone we're in. Yeah, sure, that's cool. Matt, Matt, we've, we've had it actually 360 feedbacks about it, but it worked out great. Because um, then you uh, you can anonymize a lot of the wording that is employee, you can tell what employee yeah. was. Yeah. Right. right, so it, it did a great job of actually changing the language sufficiently mm -hmm. where it really was a good feedback. And then you, if you can also feed it a bunch of the uh, statistical data mm -hmm. right, and get a better summary of yeah. coaching your feedback, then even that manager would. Cause Otherwise, you have to train the manager yeah. how to actually do that, right? So there are some some good use cases along those on that one. Really interesting. So, so the easiest thing people try to do is where it was cut and paste before. Now they're using prompt and then taking that information from there. So the job descriptions one, a lot of times people did cut and paste work. Yeah. So that became very easy. A lot of programmers using ChatGPT for writing the initial code. Again, these things used to be cut and paste from before, and now it's basically go to one place and then collect it from there. Right. Right. So the easier ones are from the cut and paste part, and then going from there to the next level, it's like what you were talking about, the reference level. Right. So, yeah. That's a more basic question. Sure. Which is, and I've heard this from a number of sources, where people feel like it's a little lazy to be using these resources, or it's not authentic. You haven't put the work that's needed to put into this. It's kind of like to the conversation I remember the times talk about plagiarism because professors were concerned that students aren't really putting their work into this effort. And so I'm trying to, I guess, think about the potential uh, negative uh, impressions people may have 
if an organization is using these services. I mean, we're hearing, we're hearing it very positively. I want to deal with the other side because it might be a generational divide yeah. or whatever. I guess I want to be mindful of those kinds of challenges that might be out there when people are using it. Because, uh, you know, we put a, a, let's say, a block together. Like, well, you didn't put really work into that. You used some time. I mean, that kind of criticism. I don't know what, what kind of response you got to be had to that kind of criticism. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting and, and important, uh, you know, point to, to, to certainly raise and engage. Uh, I think in the context of, of the workplace, um, what I think the challenge will be sort of figuring out how these systems can be both a, a tool for efficiency. And the idea, right, is that if you're sort of using these tools that can sort of automate certain tasks, then how does that free the organization up or free uh, individuals within the organization to do more, more creative things, right? As opposed to these more robotic things that, that a system could do relatively easy uh, and effectively. The argument could be made, right, that this now frees us up to do more creative things, more innovative things, more strategic things that we wouldn't rely on an automated system to do for us. And so, so, so in that sense, the organization might make the case that it's not necessarily making us lazy, but rather creating more time, more resources, more bandwidth to really sort of you know, advance our work forward through creativity, innovation, more solutions-oriented kinds of activities. Yeah. And leveling it up, right? It's, it's more of an augmentation, a complement to, than, than total. And, and the other thing, you know, so what I'm hearing here, which, which is I think we're on the cusp of this too, is sort of designing these systems or, or integrating these systems in ways right, that, are, that are specific to your organization. So you could almost right, imagine creating a chat GPT that's specific to what it is you're trying to do as an organization, using your own data, using your own kinds of uh, you know, sentiments, uh, values, and really trying to build a language model right, that can support and create, generate content that's relevant to that. I mean, for me, that's the really interesting sort of promise of this technology, is how we will adopt it, how we will innovate, and how we will use it right in ways that are specific to our own values and our own mission. So as opposed to just using ChatGPT as a, just a general tool that anyone could use sort of universally, how do we sort of yeah. work with uh, you know, the, the architects or the engineers of this system to design it in a way that's really unique and novel to what it is we're trying to do as an organization? Just picked up a little out of last week with our HR Connect team. It's our HR call center. Okay. We get 20,000 calls a year, and so turned over the data from all those call volumes to our tech partners and said, hey, do you want, how do you apply not external chat GPT, but internal chat GPT right. okay. to sort through what are these typical questions and how do we get more of an interactive response to our employees instead of using our tech center? It will, it'll mean sort of redeploying some of those um, phone resources to more like content curators and help us to sort of design the answers. But so it's going to change our workforce, but I think there is a, a company specific application to it for sure. So that's good. Okay, you had a question? Yeah, I, yeah. I have a question. How do you manage kind of issues of, you know, personal uh, information in data? Because if you submit to OpenAI or ChatGPT, that you were basically giving them rights to that data. So thinking of the example around performance reviews, you might be taking performance review information from other right. folks, and now you use, a, use ChatGPT to do a job description on me. That private information is part of that language learning model. So then when my kid later goes on, hey, write a biography of my dad, it's like he was born here, he's born there, and he's a crappy manager who cries in one of us. Okay. We all do that. <laughs> So, so that, that's right. And we could do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you put that as part of the model, we're struggling with this ourselves as we get started. So the, so the interesting answer to that is, it, back to the point, it needs to come with inside your organization. So let's talk a little bit about that. So the, the phase in which it'll start to evolve inside a business is inside of your privacy, inside of your walls. The power of the, oh, first of all, that gives you that value proposition of the security, privacy, et cetera, that you already are, are sort of, uh, you know, abiding by today with the other extra value that it's actually able to pull from what's in context and relative to what's already in your docs and in your own private sort of world, in your work environment. So you're absolutely right. 
Um, there, it's, it's interesting in application to go out there and use ChatGPT where we think it, it has a lot of power and value is when it falls inside your organization. You're using the same functionality to make that happen. And I'd love to show you some examples of sort of how that could play out in your world and maybe give you an uh, opportunity to imagine sort of like, okay, this could be really helpful. Um, and so maybe I'll jump into just a couple of those because we think it, it can, it's definitely gonna hit on the creativity, the productivity, and, and sort of the skill side. So let's, let me see if this is gonna actually work, the magic of technology here. And um, let me show you, you know, if we talked about like, give me that first draft, you know, how could it play out in Word? Is it you need to create a customer proposal and don't have time for writer's block. Copilot can draft a proposal based on your customer notes in OneNote as well as another internal document. Copilot scans the target files and gets to work, quickly generating a first draft with all the key details from the files you provided. Now let's say you want this to look like one of your previous proposals. Copilot can give you a draft in the format you typically use by specifying a reference file, and it can also insert relevant images from another file. To add the final polish, Copilot can generate a short summary at the top of your document and also suggest ways to strengthen your proposal with options such as adding an FAQ, which it will generate for you as a starting point for you to refine and add to. Copilot has taken a tedious task, simplified it, and freed you to focus on the details that matter most. So that kind of gets to the point of like, okay, wh where is that stuff in the first place? Because I don't remember it was. And then I have all these different resources that I can pull together, but it gets you that synchronized view really quickly and then you can sort of edit and become a more proficient editor in that process. So these are these are some just, you know, these are the tools we're kind of using each and every day. You're going to see some more in our keynote this afternoon, but mostly just to highlight that if we can take some of this advanced technology and put it into uh, the tools that we're using every day, you know, how could it sort of unlock different things. So here's, here's Everyone has had a moment when they wish that they could turn their proposal into a customer-ready presentation without having to start from scratch. Now you can. Using just your own words, Copilot can translate Word into PowerPoint. Now you have a professional-looking presentation that you can hone and polish. Let's say you want to add a slide. Give Copilot some quick instructions and it immediately generates it for you. There it goes. Copilot doesn't always get everything right. So it's important to verify you are happy with it and make any edits that are needed. So this slide is too wordy. You can ask Copilot to make it more visual, which it does effortlessly. And check this out, Copilot can even animate the slide. It gives it a professional design treatment in a single click. But it doesn't stop there. Copilot automatically generates speaker notes for all your slides. It's not only a time saver, it's helping you be a better presenter. For me, it's always the speaker notes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, I mean, I like the slide part. The speaker notes. Oh my God, this is good, right? You had a question, sir. So, jaw drop that both from awe and horror. So I decided to make it technology because I think where my head goes for the future of work people is yeah. this is incredible when you have a cadre of leaders and employees who are already skilled in the generation piece. So they already know how to edit, but they know it a little more. How do you then think about a generation of people who actually just will kind of, you know, remix the stuff that exists, but not necessarily have the lens for what good is or what's missing? That's where, like, that already is kind of going to, like, what would I, how would I teach them that? Like, what would they look for? Yeah, and I think that's, um, so th there are a lot of dilemmas associated with this, and this, this is, a, this is a, a clear and obvious one, a really important one. You've noted some as well, others, others too. And I think that's really where, both in the workplace, but also as, as I think about what's happening in, in universities and even you know, below that, really sort of helping 
develop the full range of skills and competencies to sort of master these systems, as opposed to your point, becoming just simply relying upon them to do the work without any kind of skill development, without the capacity to discern what's good, what's, what's quality, what's not. Um, and so those are, I, I think, important skills. And I think it's, it's part of the conversation that's ongoing as we think about the implications of these systems, the sort of the generative capacity, what they're generating, right, but also the capacity to evaluate, right, the right. capacity to critique and analyze. Uh, to my understanding, those are still largely human yes. skills and yes. human intelligences, right? And that's, and that's what, what we mean by this relationship between human intelligence and machine intelligence. What we're seeing here, right, is machine intelligence. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about is human intelligence, right? The ability to, dis to discern, to evaluate, to, to reassure, right, that what's being generated, right, is consistent with our values, consistent with our mission, uh, and that it, in some ways, represents what we, as an org organization, aspire to produce, generate, and create for the world. I mean, in some, in some ways, it, it actually makes us better humans, right? Because we're going to be pushed to be using reasoning and really understanding and, and, and figure out how to elevate that from that perspective. Just to build on that, so um, in the business school at, at, at UT, a lot of our faculty have moved away from trying to outgame uh, assignments to get around ChatGPT and more to use that to generate an initial response and then the assignment is to evaluate the response that ChatGPT is given. And so it's, it's changed the the tenor and strategy for assignments and for how to kind of communicate those skills that are necessary to understand the underlying concepts we're trying to convey. I think you just discovered the most um, high demand um, job is going to be that when you think about sort of the search engine that came out and that semantic engineer who knows how to put the right language into a Google to get the right you know uh, search function out. Mm -hmm. And this is a bit on steroids of what's the equivalent of the semantic engineer. On the chat GPT, we can go, okay, actually, if you're trying to get this, I've got the sales to be able to go, here's all the different inputs and layers that are going to get you what you really want. Not That's critical. A 60% of what you really want. Yeah. Well, I think um, for me, I go back to, if I can add to a couple of these things that I think about as, a, as an HR leader, to, you know, the pace at which this change is happening and the fact that we have to think about to be a co-pilot, what does it take in terms of skill building, in terms of changing minds, in terms of what is a manager's job, meaning the pace at which we would have to keep pace with you know, shifting skill set within the organizations and getting you know, upscaling, changing the skill sets, that, that is what gives me up to that, right? Like, we, sure. Yeah, we, can have, we have tools. It's like when we went from having just a calculator to having you know, an Excel spreadsheet that can do everything, that's a tool. This is a tool, but the, Everything changes, the system has to change around it, and that requires a lot of, you know, very focused, concentrated effort. And I just don't know that we've gotten my hands around it. Because you can imagine some organizations, Absolutely. right, and this is one of the one of the frequent sort of critiques or concerns that's expressed, right, is just, okay, so we have these systems, so let's just, you know, use these systems and, and fewer people, right? And so the, the, one of the big dilemmas, right, is to what, what does this mean for, for the future of work in terms of just employment, right, and, and employment prospects? And if, in fact, people believe that these machines can do more and more human uh, sort of oriented kinds of tasks, perform human oriented kinds of tasks, you know, why should we hire, why should we, you know, bring people into the organization we, when instead we can just invest in machines? And I think there's a growing recognition that that's not really the path forward that mm -hmm. most people are envisioning with these systems, but rather looking at them right as, as ways of augmenting and complementing human intelligence, but not replacing and substituting it. Yeah. I, I saw this uh, uh, clever statement on LinkedIn a, a couple months back. It says, I'm not going to lose my job to AI. I'm going to lose my job to the person who knows how to use AI. Right, so uh, yeah, it is, it's, it's a massive you know, undertaking as we think about the skill. I will say, and keep underlining this concept of natural language. Today, that's, that's massively powerful. A little bit different scenario than even from the search part, because if you can just, in your own words, just ask what you're looking for and say, I think it needs to be, that, that's just massively uh, a step forward for adoption and the ability for mo for a lot of people across the organization to like actually make sense, and I think that's why we saw it just go crazy. I mean, it it it's it's sort of usage of ChatGPT was greater than like TikTok or anything. I mean, they didn't even expect that many people were going to start utilizing it. And I think it be, it was because it was powerful but so easy to use. So then 
You add voice, I mean, it's gonna keep going pretty quickly. Um, that's the one thing we know for sure, it's, it's gonna go quickly. Uh, you know, in the spirit of, uh, you know, not taking up too much thunder on these, there, there's a couple other examples. Um, I'll show you the Outlook one, because I do think, well, actually, they're gonna show that. I'll, I'll show it to you. It's, it's, it, I think this is good. We all struggle with the pull of the inbox. Sometimes it keeps us from focusing on our most important work. But at the same time, you have important emails to respond to. Copilot can help you separate the signal from the noise and give you hours of time back. Copilot can help you triage your inbox, highlighting the most important emails to prioritize. And Copilot also helps you on the go in Outlook Mobile. It can summarize long email threads. You can draft a reply, use data from an Excel file, and Copilot will generate a reply for you. You can edit it. You can make it more concise, change the writing style, or add more context. Now all that's left to do is review the proposed response and hit send. It's a productivity game changer. Right, right, right. Right, right. I mean, I mean, I, I would agree. Like when when we sat around when we first started playing with it, like what what would be your magic wand? For me, it was going on vacation, and there's thousands of who didn't realize that you did not need to send me all that, you know? And 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 you read those uh, advice, adv leadership advice, like just push the delete button on all of it; it won't die. And I'm like, I can't, right? I have so much anxiety. There's something in there, but if it could tell you. Uh, these three people I care most about bullet point out the 10 things I missed and are, do I have any action items? And if it gave me that and that's all I could worry about, I, I would feel comfortable pushing delete. Does it do that? It, yes, it will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. It's coming. It's coming is the key thing. We're talking about the, yeah. So I think the other thing we spoke about was meetings. And I do think that we saw an, a, uh, adaptation of us all working in this virtual meeting setting. It can work. It can be incredibly tedious, but um, I think it has revolutionized the way that we can just communicate. And but I think there's some some critical learning. So I just I just had a, a, a funny thought oh, that yeah. occurred to me. For those Go. of you with really young children. They'll likely yes. laugh at us and say, you actually responded to all those emails? I know, <laughs> right. You should be texting. <laughs> That's how I communicate. Well, they grew up in a world, right, where generative AI will just respond for them. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Especially when I'm like, where are you? It's dinner time. Yeah. <laughs> they respond that way. OK, let's see what we got here. Imagine you have an appointment that conflicts with your weekly business review. What if you could do both? With Copilot, you can opt to follow a meeting. After the meeting ends, Copilot will summarize what you missed. You'll get a notification in Teams when the recap is ready. This recap will highlight content that was shared, summarize notes, and any action items for you or others whose names were mentioned. You see that one of your customers was discussed, and you want to learn more. You can ask Copilot clarifying questions, and it provides a detailed response. It can tell you why a certain decision was made and gives you helpful context. You can even ask Copilot what other solutions were considered. And it provides citations from the transcript so you can see where Copilot drew these conclusions. It's a huge time saver. So that was pretty cool. But the real magic of Copilot happens during a live meeting. Let's say you're in a meeting with your team. You can ask Copilot to summarize the meeting so far. You can see how it summarizes who said what, what points were made, and it's really capturing the spirit of the discussion. And as the meeting progresses, you can check in on where people stand. You can even ask Copilot what questions are unresolved. It's just amazing to see this happen in real time during a meeting. It, it does exist, it's, it's, it's shipping, yeah. It's, we're in a process, we're, we're working in a very select group of individuals, companies right now, but yeah, in, in the next months it will be. 
some companies that are Microsoft shop that your teams eventually will yeah. just roll into that. It'll, it'll be, yeah, it'll be offered in a general availability. Absolutely. So more to come for sure. Are you going to charge for it? Uh, that is still. <laughs> Tyson's always got the hard questions. <laughs> the the answer the answer is they're still working through that. Yes. Is the. So, so um, I, we're, I know we're kind of coming around the last bend, but we wanted to talk a little bit about this as well. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll move quickly uh, so we can open up for, for some final questions. But a, a lot of this, right, as, as Matthew and I were sort of thinking about this and preparing for today, um, thinking a lot about the, the well-being implications. Um, and I think a number of your comments, a number of your ob observations uh, point to this. Just thinking about some of the earlier stats that Matthew shared with you in terms of just the, the intensity of the work as we've gone hybrid, as we've gone remote, the number of meetings, the number of emails, the number of chats, right? Just the, the, the constant signals that we're all sort of bombarded by. Um, and it's sort of created, right, a lot of sort of um, questions around mental health and well-being in the workplace, in society in general, but as, as we are here today to talk primarily about the workplace environment, right, sort of thinking about well-being within the context of the workplace and how to what extent these tools can either support uh, and advance a greater well-being or if we're not careful, right, can undermine and diminish, um, you know, a greater uh, health and well-being as well. So here are just some, some, some data that um, I think this is from uh, Gallup. Uh, they've been doing sort of global uh, kinds of surveying of how people are doing, right, both before uh, and, and since the, the pandemic. And what you'll find here, right, and I think this is necessarily a surprise to any of us, that sort of workplace engagement by generation, attentiveness, um, you know, uh, meeting responsibilities, being on task, attending meetings, all of the kinds of things, right, that we would expect from our employees or teams that we're working with uh, to be responsive to what, again, whatever, responsive to whatever the missions of the organization might be. And what you'll see, generally speaking here, right, is that engagement is a challenge for, for, for people across generations. But as you think about, right, the future workforce, and if you think about younger people, I'm thinking uh, younger millennials, uh, Gen Z, and even sort of the generation coming behind them, they're beginning to talk a lot openly, more openly about mental health and about well-being. And there is an expectation, I think, on their part that as they go into these organizations that you're thinking about it, right? That you're building the initiatives and programs that can support their own mental health and well-being and their capacity, right, to be their best for you uh, and the things that your organization is interested uh, in accomplishing. Uh, we're all sort of familiar with, right, there's, there's, there is a substantial financial cost uh, to well-being. I think these are, uh, I can't recall if this is from Gallup or from McKinsey, but, uh, but just some examples of, uh, this is um, their financial costs in terms of sort of uh, instability, in terms of health and well-being, uh, in addition, right, to the sort of social and sort of human costs associated with this as well. But the point being, right, is that if your organization is not thinking about these issues, is not developing programming and interventions and models to support the the well-being of your employees that you run the risk right of incurring sort of financial uh, sort of impacts as a result of that. And I thought this is really interesting, right, in terms of sort of identifying different dimensions or different, you know, different elements or expressions of well-being uh, that in this particular uh, report by Gallup, they found that career well-being, right, how people think about their careers, their opportunities, their prospects within your organization or elsewhere are oftentimes, right, a predictor or strongly indicated to these other kinds of well-being ind indicators, social well-being, financial well-being, uh, physical and community well-being as well. So it's all to say, right, that how people are feeling about their careers feeling about their life prospects, feeling about their experience within the context of your organization has significant impact, right? So just trying to understand how these systems can either support uh, and augment that or how these systems might under, undermine or sort of diminish well-being is something that we think is really important. And these are things that we've already talked about here. Um, you know, Matt has give, Matthew's given you some really great examples. Uh, these systems performing mundane tasks, reducing time spent in meetings elsewhere, uh, and to the point earlier, just if they're able, just imagine, right, the amount of time you could say responding to email, how that might allow you, right, to then devote some of your cognitive energy and capacity to other things, right, that you think are more strategic, more important in terms of advancing your organization's goals. So we'll, we'll uh, I think we're going to wrap it up, but we'll leave this question for you to ponder, right? So like how will, you know, your people and culture really ad adapt to this AI? I mean, you were just raising some of those concerns. Um, you know, it's coming. It's going to be uh, a, a pretty massive 
um, wave ahead. Uh, yeah, so it's gonna take a lot of intention, uh, a lot of responsibility in sort of how we think about this technology and how it gets applied, I think is really gonna be very critical. Um, but I do think it could really help um, lift up, unlock, unleash uh, a lot of the creativity and the productivity that we, we've been hoping for um, and hopefully gets us uh, across some of that, uh, that sort of complexity that, that the flexible work has brought us as well. So any uh, parting thoughts or questions? This is not a necessarily that check to your sure. of AI, but yeah. um, I'm in HR, so there's a, a huge push to use AI um, to have your applicants record their videos, oh. and then have the machine learning watch those videos, and then determine who makes the cut to get to the company. It's a huge time investment, and especially um, for organizations, we, we hire 80,000 people a year. It's just a huge turn because we have like carryouts and checkers and our kind of people, so it goes through it. My biggest fear is also we have that technology right. that we get that people have the video and they put it up. Um, I'll just be honest, I've always told my team I will not turn on the AI. I will only let our recruiters view the videos. It's still a time savings because they can do it whenever they want to. It's not trying to spend the time with the applicant. But there's a huge push to allow the machine learning to make that decision. My biggest fear is the bias that's in there because if they're learning off of Previous um, applicants. If someone like I only like a person that looks like this, then that computer learns that, and then you continue perpetuating that bias. But I don't know if there's any um, legislation around that, or if there's anything coming where you can actually check on the bias. That's that's a big concern, especially with these things getting so much. No, that's, that's a great point to, to perhaps even end on. So I just, um, we're doing a lot of this, this asking these sim very same types of questions at UT. I just met the last, I just met the past year at MIT working with colleagues who are looking precisely at this. You're exactly right that, that one of the inherent um, sort of constraints as it relates to this technology is these systems are generating outputs, making decisions or recommendations, sometimes in ways, right, that the engineers of these systems don't even completely understand. Right. And to what extent, right, are these systems, just because of what we know about the, the, the previous data sets that they're using, the kinds of bias that are sort of baked into those data sets, gender bias, race, ethnicity bias, other kinds of biases, these machines, right, when they're sort of evaluating someone via video, they're looking at things, picking up things that if we're not absolutely consciously aware of, it could be sort of replicating, right, these sort of historical biases that have oftentimes impacted who does or doesn't have access to, um, you know, employment opportunities. So I think the point is sort of helping organizations like yours to sort of think about and understand that that's a very real aspect, and in some cases, likelihood of these systems. So how do you protect yourself against becoming a sort of victims of that kind of decision making that's mm -hmm. automated, and in some respects, not even necessarily, um, you know, we're not even aware of, and yet, are there protocols, are there sort of instances that we can create, right, to help us sort of mitigate what right, some of those biases might be? Absolutely. So I know we're at time. We'll leave you with two resources. So um, Microsoft.com Work Lab. So Work Lab is a digital publication. It uh, has all of the research that we've conducted. And, and uh, you can find that long and short form, editorial podcasts, guides, um, as well as um, Good Systems, which is part of U UT, uh, Austin UT's um, system there that so research uh, and all the resources well thank you hopefully this was valuable and uh, please yeah definitely dive into the resources and we're around if there's any other additional questions thank you, thank you very much <laughs>